And so when we think about language, for me, it's really one of who is it that we're either trying to include or exclude purposefully. You know, um, one of the most important fundamental uh, truths for me has been as we think about broader issues of justice, equity, inclusion, and equality um, is around as how we think about poverty. And, and, you know, and for me, it's poverty is man-made. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. We share highlights from a webinar hosted by Cornell's Translator Interpreter Program featuring its founder, Fatima Sumar, a Cornell alum who now works in the Biden administration, as well as our own Angelica Kramer. Welcome to a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's media manager. This week, we will share some highlights from a webinar that Angelica took part in at the beginning of April with Fatima Sumar. Fatima founded the Translator Interpreter Program at Cornell as a student before graduating in 2001. She is now the President Biden-appointed Vice President of the Department of Compact Operations at the Millennium Challenge Corporation. This webinar was hosted by the current student leadership of the Translator Interpreter Program and recorded by Matt Gorney. We'll hand it over to the students now. How has your time at TIP affected your later career and personal development? To me, language is more than what we speak or what we write. It is so much about language is about who we are as individuals, as communities, as countries, as collectives. And what I really took away from my time both at Cornell, uh, my time working at the Public Service Center, my time with TIP, but also with um, with all breaks into the streets, language expansion, and so many other programs, working with Joyce and others, is that when you think about investing in language, you're actually opening up yourself to people, communities that are so different from you and give you such access to a completely different way of thinking, right? So for me, TIP actually wasn't, in the beginning, it was about identifying a gap and plugging a gap. But I think what it actually opened up was a broader dialogue to the needs of communities that actually get completely unrecognized in our current systems. Many communities can be invisible in the way that we view them today, right? Data may not exist on who they are, what their needs are. They may not get captured because they're more marginalized. They may not get captured because they may not speak dominant languages, whether that's English, Spanish, French, et cetera. Um, They may not get captured because they're undocumented. And frankly, they don't want to be captured by the system. They want to stay under the radar. So I think what it really helped inform me and my, um, as I went forward, as I graduated from Cornell, is that if, if, you know, in a career like mine, I, you know, I signed up for a career um, in foreign policy and international developments where I, every day I work to reduce poverty around the world. If we're going to succeed in that mission, you have to actually understand who you're working with. And you can't do that. You, language is just, the, to me, the door. It's the entry point of that conversation, right? It's not, it's it's a means um, and a tool in our toolkit. And so that, to me, was the power of what TIP really helped me understand in very fundamental ways. Um, you know, since then, I've worked largely for the U.S. government representing um, our country overseas. I've been, you know, I've been to over 60 countries, over half of them in a capacity of representing the government working on uh, poverty reduction programs, working on our foreign policy economic development. And in all those communities, what we've really seen is language as a means of inclusion and equity. And you can't actually talk about international development or development here in the United States, right? You don't have to go very far. You can't actually talk about fighting poverty, fighting inequality, fighting injustice, if you don't actually understand how people speak and what they speak and what it represents for them. So those are some of the biggest things that TIP helped me really realize and help instill in me as core values for my career when I graduated from Cornell. How would you both define language access and equity and what is the importance of language learning and why is it important uh, important to attain language equity in our society today? So I think in terms of access, people are generally familiar with concepts of access for people with disabilities. 
being able to use certain services such as restaurants and, and public buildings. And language access is very similar in that regard in that it means that people who don't speak the dominant language very well or at all are able to use and benefit from a wide range of services. So when you think about equity, that concept is synonymous to me with fairness and justice. So equity exists when the biases derived from the dominant cultural norms and values no longer predict or influence how we do in our society. And so we just have to keep in mind that we want to promote fair and impartial access to rights and opportunities. And language matters. That's how we communicate. Words can change lives. And I think in this interconnected world that we live in, it is so important to have intercultural and linguistic competencies because as Fatima mentioned earlier too, language is open doors. So maybe I'll just build on that by saying languages can also shut doors, right? On the converse, if, if, we, if we actually don't prioritize the linkages between language and equity. So when we think about any society, I mean, we can take we can take right here at home as we're thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic and how what it's really shown all of us is not that we have inequality. We, we've known that for a while. It's exacerbated these inequalities and shown us just how deep these rifts are and that these problems aren't, aren't just far away in overseas countries where we tend to think about the relationship with poverty in the developing world, they're right here at home in, in the United States, in Western Europe, and in, in many um, emerging uh, economies. And so, when we think about when we think about um, the power of language, and you know, the word inclusion comes to mind for me. It's really kind of thinking through who is it that we're trying to give access to. Who are we actually including as part of the intervention, as part of the policy priority, as part of our outreach? You're seeing this, you know, just I'm sort of a conversation near and dear to all of your hearts at this moment are COVID vaccinations, just as an example, right? I'm up here in Boston right now. Um, we have some of the hardest hit communities are in immigrant and more vulnerable populations um, in areas where we're, we're seeing um, some of the highest rates of uh, issues with access with vaccination distribution, but then also when you have distribution with convincing that the vaccine is safe and effective to use. So also getting the uptick and you're seeing this play out throughout the country in many, many different urban areas um, at the same time. And so when we think about language for me, it's really one of who is it that we're either trying to include or exclude purposefully. You know, um, one of the most important fundamental uh, truths for me has been as we think about the broader issues of justice, equity, inclusion, and equality, um, is around as how we think about poverty. And, and you know, and for me, it's poverty is man-made. Poverty is man-made. We deliberately choose through our public policies, through our corporate policies, through our tax policies, who we want to keep poor and who we want to have access to more resources, right? That's what public policy actually is. That is the core foundation of public policy is to make those choices on behalf of all of us. And so when you think about the, that intersection of inclusion, access, equality with language, language then almost becomes the precursor to every one of those other conversations because it starts helping us understand who are we deliberately choosing to give access to and who do we deliberately say is not a priority for us in our system? And, and here's why. And we can either justify that or explain that away. And so it's almost a precursor to conversations that many of us are having on public policy spaces, whether that's local, national, or international. And so I think there's such a power here of really thinking through when you think about investing in language learning, for instance, as students, for instance, at Cornell or any universities you're at around the world or in your own home communities, and you think about the role at an agency level of giving access, um, I think there's real, really a power here of it's beyond speaking. It's around how do you connect communities that otherwise would be completely disconnected from access to having the same rights and opportunities that, that others have. Um, and so that was where I think the power of programs like TIP really help us be at those intersections. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for both of your responses. Uh, we definitely agree language is a very powerful tool and often overlooked. And um, going back to the importance of inclusion that you mentioned, uh, Fatima, our next question is actually related to language inclusion and access. And we would love to hear 
both of your thoughts on the next question, uh, which is uh, given the decrease in uh, language diversity through uh, language extinction, as well as a continued rise in xenophobia, uh, what do you both think that TIP uh, should do to continue its mission of bridging language and cultural barriers while building mutual understanding and community trust? And um, additionally, in extension to the uh, previous question, uh, are, do you think there are any specific resources that you would recommend uh, would be beneficial for both TIP and our community uh, in promoting language access and equity? So I think advocacy is one of the most important tools in your toolkit. Events like this webinar today really raise awareness of the issue. And I think sometimes people may not think about um, language access and language equity. They don't think about what it entails to learn a language, to acquire a language where you can actually use it at an advanced level, where it would allow you to step in and translate or interpret in situations that, that TIP serves for community agencies. So I think what's important is not to wait until a problem occurs, but as Fatima had mentioned earlier, looking for these gaps proactively and thinking about what, what can be done. Um, and I think that's that's where, where TIP is, is excelling here. Um, university campuses have a lot of resources. Um, the diversity and inclusion website here at Cornell talks about open doors, open hearts, and open minds. And I always like to um, expand um, as our Cornell's motto to any person, any study in any language, because I think that's an important aspect as, as we keep saying here, we communicate, the world is shrinking, we travel much more, we, we work with people from all sorts of different cultures and being able to not only understand the language that other people speak, but also being able to understand their, their cultural backgrounds and how that impacts what they do and how they see the world is really important. Um, there are lots of other campus groups, other units on our campus with a global focus. So I think joining these forces in advertising and promoting is really the first step. Again, you know, drawing attention to the issue at hand is, is the first step. Um, and of course, there's there's a number of um, regional and national and international associations. I'm thinking, for example, about uh, JNCL Nicholas, which is the Joint National Committee for Languages and the National Council for Languages and International Studies. They are they are our voice on Capitol Hill. They have a lot of advocacy materials when it comes to language policy. Um, or thinking more about the, the educational component, best practices, there is ACTFL, the, the National Association on the Teaching, um, the, the Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. So I think thinking about um, what are the local resources, what are resources in the area, um, and then growing larger into um, the nation as a whole and just leveraging all of that in, in pursuit of advocacy and, and raising awareness. Yeah, I, I really, that really resonates with me. And, you know, I would, um, my unsolicited advice, I guess, to those of you currently in the program or thinking about joining the program is first, if you're one of the student translator interpreters, think of your role beyond just the specifics of language to one of being an ambassador and really thinking about what it is you are representing and translating back around beyond language, think about your role of translation to include culture, gender barriers, religion, religious barriers, racial barriers. Um, language is just the gateway, as we've been saying so far, to so much of the other. And we live in such a hyper-polarized environment uh, lately where we, we actually don't even understand that there is another. <laughs> And we don't know who they are. And it, it, it can be scary because they're so different than us, right? And that has become a national paradigm for us in this country over the last decade or so. And if we're going to combat that, then think about your roles really as first and foremost, you are ambassadors. You are ambassadors to communities who otherwise are literally left out of the conversation, right? And so there's a lot of power in that. And there's a lot of responsibility in that to do that right. If you don't know enough about that culture, if you don't know enough about 
you know, the, the different aspects, take time to educate yourself beyond language because language is also your entry point, but it doesn't also, it's not a substitute for learning even more and pushing yourselves to learn more about those communities where they come from. They may speak the same language because they are similar communities from West Africa, but the differences between those communities, between their countries can be very profound, right? And so you also have an obligation to not to not fall into the trap of stereotypes, to really push us out and to think about how we can do a better job of educating others. So that's my first is think about tip translators and interpreters really being ambassadors, student ambassadors to local communities. The second is, I think you have a huge opportunity at Cornell right now, um, both at TIP, but more broadly speaking, to really think about the role of technology and uh, what opportunities we have in this digital space. So we're seeing some of them emerge just because of force with COVID, right? And, And we're all kind of forced to go online and to use Zoom and other tech platforms. But we are leaving a lot of people out as a result of that, particularly communities that don't have access to high-speed broadband. So thinking about inclusion access issues, even as you think about the opportunities around the digital space is really important. Um, Thinking about how you can use digital tools that are emerging every single day. In my field, for instance, where we don't have access right now to travel to communities far away because of the pandemic, Um, We are using a lot of geospatial technologies, um, drones and other spatial mapping technologies and trying to think about how we can learn more and more about where communities are and what they need using those types of digital tools. But we have to think carefully and responsibly about them and and what they imply and what they mean. So first, I think you you really do have an opportunity in this digital space. And maybe when the pandemic is over, you don't go back to just what it was. You think about some type of hybrid model that you take forward um, in ways that could be really powerful. The, 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 the next point that I'd offer you guys to think about is um, silos and how you can bust silos. So Cornell is both, a, on the one hand, incredibly rich as an institution and university because you have literally the whole world at your fingertips, right? And you have world-class access in pretty much any field and any topic. Uh, spread out throughout the university. And that's why it is, you know, privileged to be one of the best universities in the world. On the other hand, it has a lot of silos within that and helping bridge some of those silos, which I know is an ongoing focus of leadership and which so many initiatives are taking place to do that is a huge opportunity to think about what other pieces and powers are there that have not been tapped into. How can you connect to those spaces, whether it's with Dyson or Hotel or the Atkinson Center or others, and really thinking through the opportunities. Um, And then beyond Cornell, you know, I would love to see, so 20 years ago, I tried this. I failed. So I just want to say I failed 20 years ago um, because 20 years ago, I didn't have this whole screen of people. We didn't have a board. We didn't have an organization. It was was just kind of me at the student level, uh, Joyce supporting me as a faculty. And um, it was just kind of the two of us on this. So What I'm going to challenge all of you with now and going forward um, for classes that come after you is we've piloted this now for 20 years, right? And we know it works. We know it's cost effective. We know it's simple and it can be transformative. So how can you take and, 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 and scale this up either geographically in the Northeast corridor, nationally? How can you get and combine with other universities and other communities all around um, the country um, does it have to be limited to the U.S.? Do you have can we can we have pockets even overseas with other countries where we have partnerships? And can you think about scaling up this effort in ways that could have transformative effects where you don't actually have to live right geographically next to a Cornell student for you to have impact? Um, can you change and help have impact anywhere in the country or in the world just using the power of our networks, partnerships, and technology? I don't know what the answer is. I hope, I, but I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys think about that and if there's ways to think about that, um, because we basically have a 20-year pilot now where you have served hundreds and hundreds of, of um, families in the broader area, and in some cases, even beyond that, uh, speaking dozens of languages. We know the power of what TIP has to offer. How can we unleash that power um, to scale? I think that's really the question before all of you guys today. And I'm excited to see what you do with that. 
Thank you guys so much. It was such an honor to be here with all of you. I just wanted to say as someone who's not a college student right now, but with all of you today, I'm so inspired by what you guys are doing and the fact that you put in so much love, time, and care to keep not just this, but so many of the other initiatives that you're part of going. Um, Working um, on these programs at Cornell changed my life. It changed my career. It taught me so much before I even got my first full-time job out of college. And so it it really, I think, they're lifelong skills. It's a lifelong community. You guys should be so, so proud of yourselves and what you're doing. And um, thank you for modeling what public service leadership looks like from from where you sit and stand. And you're inspirational to all of us too, from wherever we're sitting in our in our parts of the world. So, so thank you for that. All of you are doing tremendous work and tremendously important work. And I am delighted that I can be of very little support um, in that in that venture. And I look forward to taking tip to the next level. Let's let's go global. Next week, Eduardo Viana da Silva will join us on Speaking of Language. He will give a talk as part of our monthly LRC speaker series titled Developing an Open and Inclusionary Language Textbook for Portuguese. You can catch his talk live on Zoom on Thursday, May 13th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern and get the exclusive preview on our podcast. Until then, auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners. And do stay tuned for our next episode.